collected wheel publications volume 1 to 15 buddhist publications society kandy sri lanka the seven factors of enlightenment sat bojang by piedasi tero introduction the tipitaka the buddhist canon is replete with references to the factors of enlightenment bojang expounded by the enlightened one on different occasions in the book of the kindred saints 5 sangyutta nikaya mahavag we find a special section under the title bojang sangyutta where in the buddha discourses on the bojangas in diverse ways in this section are three discourses or sermons that have been recited by buddhists since the time of the buddha as a protection paritta or pirit against pain disease and adversity the term bojang is composed of bodhi plus ang bodhi denotes enlightenment to be exact insight concerned with the realization of the four noble truths namely the noble truth of suffering the noble truth of the origin of suffering the noble truth of the cessation of suffering and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering ang means factors or limbs bodhi plus ang bojang therefore means the factors of enlightenment or the factors for insight wisdom bojangas bojangas they are called venerable sir now in what respect are they called bojangas queried a monk of the buddha the succinct reply of the master was they conduce to enlightenment monk that is why they are so called bodaya sangvatta niti ko bikku tasma bojangati uchanti further says the buddha just as monks in a peak house all rafters whatsoever go together to the peak slope to the peak join in the peak and of them all the peak is reckoned chief even so monks the monk who cultivates and makes much of the seven factors of wisdom slopes to nibbana inclines to nibbana tends to nibbana the seven factors are one mindfulness sati two keen investigation of the dhamma dhamma vichaya three energy virya four rapture or happiness piti five calm pasaddi six concentration samadhi seven equanimity upekka one of the three discourses on the bojangas mentioned above begins thus i heard at one time the buddha was living at rajagaha at velwana bamboo grove in the squirrels feeding ground 
at that time the venerable maha kasapa who was living in pippali cave was sick stricken with a severe illness then the buddha rising from his solitude at eventide visited the venerable maha kasapa took his seat and spoke to the venerable maha kasapa in this voice well kasapa how is it with you are you bearing up are you enduring do your pain lessen or increase are there signs of your pains lessening and not increasing no lord i am not bearing up i am not enduring the pain is very great there is a sign not of the pains lessening but of their increasing kasapa these seven factors of enlightenment are well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed they conduce to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana what are the seven one mindfulness this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana to investigation of the dhamma this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana 3 energy this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana 4 rapture this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana 5 calm this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana 6 concentration this kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and well cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana 7 equanimity kasapa is well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed it conduces to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana these seven factors of enlightenment verily kasapa are well expounded by me cultivated and much developed by me and when cultivated and much developed they conduce to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana verily blessed one they are factors of enlightenment verily welcome one they are factors of enlightenment uttered maha kasapa thus spoke the buddha and the venerable maha kasapa rejoicing welcomed the utterances of the worthy one and the venerable maha kasapa rose from that illness there and then that ailment of the venerable 
maha kasapa vanished another discourse maha chunda bodjanga sutta of the three mentioned about reveals that at one time the buddha himself was ill and then venerable maha chunda recited the bodjanga's factors of enlightenment and that the buddha's grievous illness vanished man's mind tremendously and profoundly influences and affects the body if allowed to function viciously and entertain unwholesome and harmful thoughts mind can cause disaster even kill a being but mind also can cure a sick body when concentrated on right thoughts with right understanding the effects mind can produce are immense mind not only makes sick it also cures an optimistic patient has more chance of getting well than a patient who is worried and unhappy the recorded instances of faith healing include cases in which even organic diseases were cured almost instantaneously buddhism buddha dhamma is the teaching of enlightenment one who is keen on attaining enlightenment should first know clearly the impediments that block the path to enlightenment life according to the right understanding of a buddha is suffering and that suffering is based on ignorance or avijja ignorance is the experiencing of that which is unworthy of experiencing namely evil further it is the non perception of the conglomerate nature of the aggregates non perception of sense organ and object in their respective and objective natures non perception of the emptiness or the relativity of the elements non perception of the dominant nature of the sense controlling faculties non perception of the dasness the infallibility of the four truth and the five hindrances pancha nivarnani are the nutrients of or condition for this ignorance they are called hindrances because they completely close in cut off and obstruct they hinder the understanding of the way to release from suffering these five hindrances are sensuality kama chand ill will vyapad obduracy of the mind and mental factors tinamid restlessness and flurry uddach kukkuch and doubt vichikicha and what is the nutrients of those hindrances the three evil modes of life tini ducharitani bodily vocal and mental prone doing this threefold nutrients is in turn nourished by non restraint of the senses indriya asamvaro which is explained by the commentator as the admittance of lust and hate into the six sense organs of eye ear nose tongue body and mind the nutrients of non restraint is shown to be lack of mindfulness and of complete awareness asati asampajanya in the context of nutriment the reason of non restraint is the different away of the object dhamma the lapsing from the mind of the knowledge of the lakkanas or characteristics 
of existence impermanence suffering and voidness of self and forgetfulness of the true nature of things it is when does not bear in mind the transcendence and the other characteristics of things and one allows oneself all kinds of liberties in speech and deeds and gives reign of full thought imaginary of an unskillful kind lack of complete awareness is lack of these four complete awareness of purpose sata sampajanya of suitability sappaya sampajanya of resort gochara sampajanya and of non delusion asamoha sampajanya when one does a thing without a right purpose when one looks at things or does action which do not help the growth of the good when one does things inimical to improvement when one forgets the dhamma which is the true resort of one who strives when one deludedly lays hold of things believing them to be pleasant beautiful permanent and substantial when one behaves thus then to non restraint is nourished and below this lack of mindfulness and complete awareness lies unsystematic reflection ayoniso manasikara the books say unsystematic reflection is reflection that is of the right course that is taking the impermanent as permanent the painful as pleasure the soulless as a soul the bad as good the constant rolling on that is sansara is rooted in unsystematic thinking when unsystematic thinking increases it fulfills two things ignorance and lust for becoming ignorance being present the origination of the entire mass of suffering comes to be thus a person is a shallow thinker like a ship drifting at the wind's will like a herd of cattle swept into the whirlpools of a river like an ox yoke to a wheel contraption goes on revolving in the cycle of existence sansara and it is said that imperfect confidence asadhya in the buddha the dhamma and the sangha is the condition which develops unsystematic reflection and imperfect confidence is due to non hearing of the true law the dhamma asad dhamma savana finally one does not hear the dhamma through lack of contact with the wise through not consorting with the good with the wa- finally one does not hear the dhamma through lack of contact with the wise through not consorting with the good asap purusha sanseva thus want of good friendship kalyana mitata appears to be the basic reason for the ills of the world and conversely the basis and nutriment of all good is sown to be good friendship that furnishes one with the food of the sublime dhamma which in turn produces confidence in the triple gem tiratana the buddha dhamma and the sangha when one has confidence in the triple gem there come into existence profound or systemic thinking mindfulness and complete awareness restraint of the senses the three good modes of life the four arousings of mindfulness the seven factors of enlightenment 
and deliverance through wisdom one after another in due order let us now deal with the enlightenment factors one by one the first is sati mindfulness it is the instrument most efficacious in self mastery and whosoever practices it has found the path to deliverance it is fourfold mindfulness consisting in contemplation of the body kaya anupassana feeling vedana anupassana mind chitta anupassana and mental objects or mind contents dhamma anupassana the man lacking in this all important quality of mindfulness cannot achieve anything worthwhile the buddha's final admonition to his disciples on his deathbed was this transcend are all component things work out your deliverance with heedfulness vaya dhamma sankara appamadena sampadeta and the last words of the venerable sariputta the foremost disciple of the buddha who predeceased the master were this strive on with heedfulness this is my advice to you sampadeta appamadena esa me anusasana in both these injunctions the most significant and pregnant word is appamada which literally means incessant heedfulness man cannot be heedful unless he is fully aware of his actions whether they are mental verbal or physical at every moment of his waking life only when a man is fully awake to and mindful of his activities can he distinguish good from bad and right from wrong it is in the light of mindfulness he will see the beauty or the ugliness of his deeds the word appamada throughout the tipitaka is used to denote sati mindfulness pamada is defined as absence of mindfulness says the buddha in the anguttara nikaya monks i know not of any other single thing of such power to cause the arising of good thoughts if not yet arisen or to cause the waning of evil thoughts if already arisen as heedfulness in him who is heedful good thoughts not yet arisen do arise and evil thoughts if arisen do vain constant mindfulness and vigilance are necessary to avoid ill and perform good the man with presence of mind who surrounds himself with watchfulness of mind satima the man of courage and earnestness gets a head of the lethargic the heedless pamatto as a race horse outstrips a decrepit hack the importance of sati mindfulness in all our dealings is clearly indicated by the following striking words of the buddha mindfulness disciples i declare is essential in all things everywhere it is as salt is to the curry the buddha's life is one integral picture of mindfulness he is the sada sato the ever mindful the ever vigilant he is the very embodiment of mindfulness there was never an occasion when buddha manifested signs of sluggishness inactivity or thoughtlessness 
right mindfulness or complete awareness in a way is superior to knowledge because in the absence of mindfulness it is just impossible for a man to make the best of his learning intelligence devoid of mindfulness tends to lead a man astray and entice him from the path of rectitude and duty even people who are well informed and intelligent fail to see a thing in its proper perspective when they lack this all important quality of mindfulness men of good standing who have acted or spoken thoughtlessly and without due consideration to the consequences are often subjected to severe and justifiable criticism mindfulness is the chief characteristic of all wholesome actions tending to one's own and others profit appamado mahato attaya sangvartati mindfulness is conducive to great profit that is the highest mental development and it is through such attainment that deliverance from the sufferings of sansara is possible the man who delights in mindfulness and regards heedlessness with dread is not liable to fall away he is in the vicinity of nibbana the second enlightenment factor is dhamma vichaya keen investigation of the dhamma it is the sharp analytical knowledge of understanding the true nature of all constituents things animate or inanimate human or divine it is see in things as they really are see in things in their proper perspective it is the analysis of all component things into their fundamental elements right down to their ultimates through keen investigation one understands that all compounded things pass through the inconceivably rapid movements of utpada titi and bang or of arising reaching a peak and ceasing just as a river in flood sweeps to a climax and fades away the whole universe is constantly changing not remaining the same for two consecutive moments all things in fact are subjected to causes conditions and effects hetu pacha and pala systematic reflection yoniso manasikara comes naturally through right mindfulness and it urges one to discriminate to reason and investigate shallow thinking unsystematic reflection ayonuso manasikar makes men muddle headed and then they fail to investigate the nature of things such people cannot see cause and effect seed and fruit the rise and fall of compounded things says the buddha this doctrine is for the wise and not for the unwise Buddhism is free from compulsion and caution and does not demand of the follower blind faith at the very outset the skeptic will be pleased to hear of its call for investigation Buddhism from beginning to end is open to all those who have eyes to see and minds to understand the buddha never endeavored to rin out of his followers blind and submissive faith in him and his teaching he tutors his disciples in the ways of discrimination and intelligent inquiry 
to the inquiring kalamas the buddha answered right is to doubt right is to question what is doubtful and what is not clear in a doubtful matter wavering does arise we find this dialogue between the master and his disciples if now knowing this and perceiving this would you say we honor our master and through respect for him we respect what he teaches nay lord that which you affirm disciples it is not only that which you yourselves have recognized seen and grabs yes lord and in conformity with this thoroughly correct attitudes of the inquiry the philosophers of later times observed as the wise test of purity of gold by burning cutting and examining it by means of a piece of touchstone so should you accept my words after examining them and not merely out of regard and reverence for me thus blind belief is condemned in the analytic teaching vibhajavad of the buddha the truth of the dhamma can be grasped only through calm concentrative thought and insight samatha and vipassana and never through blind faith one who goes in quest of truth is not satisfied with surface knowledge he wants to dwell deep and see what is beneath that is the sort of search encourage in buddhism that type of search yields right understanding we read in the text the following story on one occasion upali a fervent follower of nigandranatha putta the jain visited the buddha thoughtfully listened to the dhamma gain sadda confidence based on knowledge and forthwith manifested his readiness to become a follower of the master nevertheless the master said of a truth upali make thorough investigation and thus discourage him this clearly shows that the buddha was not keen on converting people to his way of thinking and to his fold he did not interfere with another man's freedom of thought for freedom of thought is the bright right of every individual it is wrong to force someone out of the way of life which accords with his outlook and character spiritual inclinations and tendencies compulsion in every form is bad it is coercion of the blackest kind to make a man gulp down beliefs for which he has no relish such force feeding cannot be good for anybody anywhere he that cultivates dhamma which a investigation of the dhamma focuses his mind on the five aggregates of grasping the panchupadana kanda and endeavors to realize the rise and fall or the arising and passing away udevaya of this conglomeration of bhaya forces suddha sankar punja this conflux of mind and matter nama roopa santati it is only when he fully realizes the evanescent nature of his own mind and body that he experiences happiness joyous anticipation therefore it is said yato yato samma sati khandanam udyabhayam labati piti pamojjam amatantam vijanatam whenever he reflects on the rise and fall of the aggregates he experiences unalloyed joy and happiness to the discerning one that reflection is 
deathless nibbana what is impermanent and not lasting he sees as sorrow fraught what is impermanent and sorrow fraught he understand as void of permanent and everlasting soul self or ego entity it is this grasping this realization of the three characters or laws transcendence anicca soro dukkha and no self soullessness anatta which is known to buddhist as vipassana jnana or penetrative insight and which like the razor edge sword entirely eradicates all the latent tendencies anushya with it all the varied ramifications of sorrows cause are finally destroyed a man who ascends to this summit of vision is an arahant a perfect one whose clarity of vision whose depth of insight penetrates into the deepest recesses of life and cognizes the true nature that underlies all appearance no more can he be swept off his feet by the glamour of things ephemeral no more can he be confused by fearful and terrible appearances no more is it possible for him to have a clouded view of phenomena for he has transcended all capacity for error through the perfect immunity which penetrative insight alone can give the third enlightenment factor is virya energy it is a mental property chetasika and a sixth limb of the noble eightfold path they are called samma vayama right effort the life of the buddha clearly reveals that he was never subjected to moral or spiritual fatigue from the hour of his enlightenment to the end of his life he strove tirelessly to elevate mankind regardless of the bodily fatigue involved and obvious to the many obstacles and handicaps that hampered his way he never relaxed in his exertion for the common weal though physically he was not always fit mentally he was ever vigilant and energetic of him it is said ah wonderful is the conqueror who ever untiring strives for the blessings of all beings for the comfort of all lives buddhism is for the sincerely zealous strong and firm in purpose and not for the indolent aradha viriya sayam dhammo nayan dhammo kusitas in the words of the buddha each individual has himself to put forth the necessary effort and work out his own deliverance with diligence the buddha is only a path revealer and not a savior who endeavors to save souls by means of a revealed religion the idea that another raises a man from lower to higher levels of life and ultimately rescues him tends to make a man indolent and weak supin and foolish others may lend us a helping hand indirectly but deliverance from suffering must be wrought out and fashioned by each one for himself a po- 
upon the anvil of his own action be ye islands unto yourself be ye your own refuge thus did the master exhort his followers to acquire self reliance a follower of the buddha should not under any circumstances relinquish hope and effort for the buddha was one who never gave up courage and effort even as a bodhisattva as an aspirant for buddhahood he had as his motto the following inspiring words ma nivat abhikkama for the not advance the man who is mindful satima and cultivates keen investigation should next put forth the necessary effort to fight his way out the function of virya or energy is fourfold it is defined as one the effort to eradicate evils that have arisen in the mind two the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen evil three the effort to develop unarisen good and four the effort to promote the further growth of good already arisen just says the vitakka santana sutanta of the majjhima nikaya number 20 as a competent carpenter o a carpenter's apprentice with a slender pin will knock out remove and dispose of a sticker one so also when through dwelling on some idea that has come to him he will unsalutary considerations connected with desire hate and delusion arise in the monk then he should engender in his mind an idea other than that former idea and connected with salutary things whereupon the evil unsalutary considerations will disappear and with their disappearing his mind will become settled subdued unified concentrated thus the path of purification is impossible for an indolent person the aspirant for enlightenment bodhi should possess unflinching energy coupled with fixed determination enlightenment and deliverance lie absolutely and entirely in his own hands man must himself by his own resolute effort rise and make his way to the portals of liberty and it is always at every moment in his power so to do those portals are not locked the key is not in possession of someone else from whom it must be obtained by prayer and entreaty they are free of all bolts and bars save those the man himself has made by precept and example the buddha was an exponent of the strenuous life hear these words of the buddha the idler who does not strive who though young and strong is full of sloth who is weak in resolution and thought that lazy and idle man will not find the way to wisdom the way to enlightenment 
following in the footsteps of the buddha the disciple things though only my skin sinews and bones remain and my blood and flesh dry up and wither away yet never will i give up my quest and serve from path of rectitude and enlightenment the fourth enlightenment factor is piti rapture or happiness this too is a mental property chetasika and is a quality which suffuses both the body and mind the man lacking in his quality cannot proceed along the path to enlightenment there will arise in him sullen indifference to the dhamma and aversion to practice of meditation and morbid manifestations it is therefore very necessary that a man striving to attain enlightenment and final deliverance from the fetters of sansara should endeavor to cultivate the all important factor of happiness no one can bestow on another the gift of happiness each one has to build it up by effort reflection and concentrated activity as happiness is a thing of the mind it should be sought not in external and material things though they may in a small way be instrumental contentment is a characteristic of the really happy individual the ordinary worldling seems to think that it is difficult to cultivate and develop contentment but by din of courage determination systematic attention and thought about the thing that one means within everyday life by controlling one's evil inclinations and by curbing the impulses the sudden tendencies to act without reflection one can keep the mind from being soiled and experience happiness through contentment in man's mind arises conflicts of diverse kinds and if these conflicts are to be controlled while still not eliminated man must give less rein to inclinations and logins in other words he must cultivate contentment hard it is to give up what loses and holds us in thrall and hard it is to exorcise the evil spirits that haunt the human heart in the safe of ugly and unwholesome thoughts these evils are the manifestations of lust hate and delusion lob dos and moh until one attains to the very crest of purity and peace by constant training of the mind one cannot defeat these host completely the mere abandoning of outward things fasting bathing in rivers and at hot spring and so forth do not tend to purify a man these things do not make a man happy holy and harmless hence the need to develop the buddha's path of purification morality meditation and insight sila samadhi and panya when discussing happiness in the context of sambhojjangas we must bear in mind the vast difference between pleasure and happiness pleasure pleasant feeling 
is something very momentary and fleeting is it wrong to say that pleasant feelings are the prelude to pain what people hug in great glee in this moment turns to be a source of pain in the next the desired is no more there when the outstretched hand would grasp it or been there and grasps it vanishes like a flake of snow in the words of robert burns pleasures are like poppies spread you see the flower its bloom is shed or like the snowfall in the river a moment white then melts forever see in a form hear in a sound perceiving an audio tasting a flavor feeling some tangible things cognizing an idea people are moved and from those sense objects and mental objects they experience a certain degree of pleasure but it is all a passing show of phenomena unlike the animal whose sole purpose is to derive a feeling of pleasure from any source at any cost man should endeavor to gain real peace or happiness real happiness or rapture comes not through grasping or clinging to things animate or inanimate but by giving up neck kam it is the detached attitude towards the world that brings about true happiness the satipatthana sutta the discourse on the foundations of mindfulness speaks of pleasant worldly feelings samisa sukha and pleasant unworldly feeling niramisa sukha niramisa sukha is far superior to samisa sukha once the buddha did not receive even a single morsel of food when he went on his arms round and an intruder remarked that the master was apparently afflicted with hunger thereupon the supreme buddha breathed forth the following verse ah happily do we dwell we who have no impediments feeders on joy shall we be even as the radiant devas unalloyed joy comes to a man who ponders thus others may harm but i will become harmless others may slay living beings but i will become a non slayer others may live unchaste but i will live pure others may utter falsehood i however will speak the truth others may slander talk harshly indulge in gossip but i will talk on the words that promote concord harmless words agreeable to the ear full of love heart pleasing coaches worthy of being born in mind timely fit and to the point others may be cowards i will not coward energetic steeped in modesty of heart unswerving as regard truth and rectitude peaceful honors contented generous and truthful in all things will i be thus conduces you to full realization perfect wisdom to nibbana is this fourth enlightenment factor pt happiness passaddi calm or tranquility is the fifth factor of enlightenment passaddi is twofold kaya passaddi is calm of body kaya here means all the mental properties rather than the physical body in other words 
calm of the aggregates of feeling vedana kand perception sanyas kand and volitional activities or confirmations sankara kand chitta pasadhi is the calm of the mind that is the aggregate of consciousness vijnana kand pasadhi is compared to the happy experience of a weary walker who sits down under a tree in the shade or the cooling of a hot place by rain hard it is to tranquilize the mind it trembles and it is unsteady difficult to guard and hold back it quicker like a fish taken from its watery home and thrown on the dry ground it wanders at will such is the nature of this ultra subtle mind it is systematic reflection yoniso manasikara that helps the aspirant for enlightenment to equate the fickle mind unless a man cultivates tranquility of mind concentration cannot be successfully developed a tranquilized mind keeps away all superficialities and futilities many a man today thinks that freedom and unrestraint are synonyms and that the taming of the self is a hindrance to self development in the teaching of the buddha however it is quite different the self must be subdued and tamed on right line if it is to become truly well the tathagata the tamed teaches the dhamma for the purpose of taming the human heart dantoso bhagava dhammataya dhamman deseti it is only when the mind is tranquilized and is kept to the right road of orderly progress that it becomes useful for the individual possessor of it and for society a disorderly mind is a liability both to the owner of it and to others all the havoc wrought in the world is wrought by men who have not learned the way of mental calm balance and poise calmness is not weakness the calm attitude at all times shows a man of culture it is not too hard a task for a man to be calm when all things around him are favorable but to be composed in mind in the midst of unfavorable circumstances is hard indeed and it is this difficult quality that is worth achieving for by such control one builds up strength of character the most deceptive thing in the world is to imagine that they alone who are noisy are strong or that they alone who are facilely busy possess power the man who cultivates calm of the mind does not get upset confused or excited when confronted with the eight vicissitudes of the world atta loka dhamma he endeavors to see the rise and fall of things conditioned how things come into being and pass away free from anxiety and restlessness he will see the fragility of the fragile a story in our books tells us how when a mother was asked why she did not lament and feel pain over the death of her beloved son said uninvited he came uninvited he passed away as he came so he went what use is there in lamenting weeping and wailing 
such is the advantage of a tranquilized mind it is unshaken by loss and gain blame and praise and undisturbed by adversity this frame of mind is brought about the weaving the sentient world in its proper perspective thus calm pasaddi leads a man to enlightenment and deliverance from suffering the sixth enlightenment factor is samadhi concentration it is only the tranquilized mind that can easily concentrate on a subject of meditation the calm concentrated mind sees things as they really are samahito yata bhutam pajanati the unified mind brings the five hindrances pancha nivarnani under subjugation concentration is the intensified steadiness of the mind comparable to an unflickering flame of a lamp in a windless place it is concentration that fixes the mind right and causes it to be unmoved and undisturbed correct practice of samadhi maintains the mind and the mental properties in a state of balance like a steady hand holding a pair of scales right concentration dispels passions that disturb the mind and brings purity and placidity of mind the concentrated mind is not distracted by sense objects concentration of the highest type cannot be disturbed under the most adverse conditions one who is intent on samadhi should develop a love of virtue seal for it is virtue that nourishes mental life and makes it coherent and calm equable and full of rich content the unrestrained mind dissipates itself in frivolous activity many are the impediments that confront a yogi and aspirant for enlightenment but there are five particular hindrances that hinder concentrative thought samadhi and obstruct the way to deliverance in the teaching of the buddha they are known as panch nivarna the five hindrances the pali term nivarna denotes that which hinders or obstructs mental development bhavana they are called hindrances because they completely close in cut off and obstruct they close the door to deliverance the five hindrances are one kama chand sensual desire two vyapad ill will three tinamid obduracy of mind and mental factors four uddacha kukkucha restlessness and worry five vichikicha doubt kama chand or sensual desires or intense thirsts for either possessions or the satisfaction of base desires is the thirst that binds man to sansara repeated wandering and close the door to final deliverance what is this sensuality where does this craving tanna arise and take root according to the discourse of the foundations of mindfulness satipattana sutta where there is the delightful and the pleasurable 
there this craving arises and takes root forms sounds smell taste bodily contact and ideas are delightful and pleasurable there this craving arises and takes root craving when obstructed by some cause is transformed to frustration and wrath as the dhammapada says tanhay jayati soko tanhay jayati bayam tanhay vipamuttas natti soko kuto bayam from craving arises grief from craving arises fear to one who is free from craving there's no grief no fear the next hindrance is vyapada ill will hatred or aversion man naturally revolts against the unpleasant and the disagreeable and also is depressed by them to be separated from the loved is painful and equally painful is the union with the lord even a disagreeable dish an unpleasant drink an unlovely demeanor or a hundred other trifles may cause indignation it is wrong thinking and systematic reflection that brings about hatred hatred on the other hand breeds hatred and clouds the vision it distorts the entire mind and its properties and thus hinders awakening to truth blocks the way to freedom this lust and hatred based on ignorance the crowning corruption of all other madness avijja paramam malam are indeed the root causes of strife and dissension between man and man nation and nation the third hindrance consists of a pair of evils tina and mid tina is lassitude or morbid state of the mind and mid is a morbid state of the mental properties tina mid as some are inclined to think is certainly not sluggishness of the body for even the arahants the perfect ones who are free from this pair of evils also experience body lifting tinamid the retards mental development under its influence mind is inert like butter to stiff to spread or or like molasses sticking to a spoon laxity is a dangerous enemy of mental development laxity leads to greater laxity until finally there arises a state of callous indifference this flabbiness of character is a fatal block to righteousness and freedom it is through virya or mental effort that one overcomes this pair of evils the fourth hindrance also comprises twin drawbacks uddacha and kukkucha restlessness and brooding or flurry and worry as a rule anyone who commits evil is mentally excited and restless the guilty and the impatient suffer from this hindrance the minds of men who are restless and unstable are like flustered bees in a shaken hive this mental agitation impedes meditation and blocks the upward path equally baneful is mental worry often people repent over the evil actions they have committed this is not praised by the buddha for it is useless to cry over spilt milk instead of brooding over such shortcomings 
one should endeavor not to repeat such unwholesome deeds there are others who worry over the good deeds omitted and duties left undone this too serves no purpose it is as futile as to ask the further bank of a river to come over that we may get to the other side instead of uselessly worrying over what good one has failed to do one should endeavor to perform wholesome deeds this mental unsteadiness kukuch also hinders mental progress the fifth and last hindrance is vichikicha doubt the pali term vi plus kicha literally means medicine less one who suffers from perplexity is really suffering from a dire disease and until and unless one sheds one's doubts one will continue to suffer from it so long as man is subject to this mental itching so long will he continue to take a clinical view of things which is most detrimental to mental development the commentators explains this hindrance as the inability to decide anything definitely it also comprises doubt with regard to the possibility of attaining the jhanas concentrative thought in this connection one may add that even non buddhists and yogis who are not concerned with the buddha dhamma and the sangha at all can inhibit doubt which kicha nivarna and gain the jhanas the yogi who attains the jhanas inhibits all five hindrances by five jhanangas characteristics or factors of jhana kama chanda is inhibited by ekagata one pointedness or unification of the mind vyapada by piti joy tinamidda by vitak applied thought uddacha kukucha by sukha happiness and vichikicha by vichara sustained thought the attainment of jhanas however is not the end aim at jhanas should be made to lead to vipassana intuitional insight it is through insight that the yogi eradicates the latent corruptions anushe kilesha and attains perfect purity so long as impurities or taints kileshas exists latent in man's mind so long will the arising of pap evil in him continue the practice of jhana whose purpose is to attain vipassana commits no ill action because the hindrances are inhibited but he has the latent impurities in his makeup and therefore he is not yet in a state of absolute security but the arahant the perfect one wipes out all the latent impurities with their rootless and bring this repetitive wandering sansara to a stand still he is one whose sansara is indubitably ended for by him the noble life has been perfected and the task done for him there is no more rebirth a sincere student who is bent on deep study cuts himself off from sense attractions and retiring to a congenial atmosphere holds fast to his studies and thus steering through all disturbing factors attains success in his examinations in the same way seated in a cloister cell or some other suitable place far from the madding crowds ignoble strife the yogi the meditator fixes his mind 
on a subject of meditation kammatana and by struggle and unceasing effort inhibits the five hindrances and washing out the impurities of his mind flux gradually reaches the first the second the third and the fourth jhana then by the power of samadhi concentrative thought thus one he turns his mind to the understanding of reality in the highest sense it is at this stage that the yogi cultivates vipassana intuitional insight it is through vipassana that one understands the real nature of all component and conditioned things vipassana aids one to see things as they truly are one sees truth face to face and comprehends that all tones are just variations struck on the one chord that runs through all life the chord which is made up of anicca dukkha and anatta impermanence sorrow and soullessness the yogi gains insight into the true nature of the world he has clung to for so long he breaks through the excel of ignorance to the hypercosmic with that final catharsis he reaches the state where dawns for him the light of nibbana the calm beyond words the unshakable deliverance of the mind akuppa cheto vimukti and the world holds nothing more for him says the dhammapada to the monk who has retired to a scheduled spot whose mind is calmed and who is clearly discerns the dhamma there comes unalloyed joy and happiness transcending that of humans the seventh and last factor of enlightenment is upekka equanimity in the abhidhamma upekka is indicated by the term tatra majjatata neutrality it is mental ecopoise and not hedonic indifference equanimity is the result of a calm concentrative mind it is hard indeed to be undisturbed when touched by the vicissitudes of life but the man who cultivates this difficult quality of equanimity is not upset amidst the welter of experience atta loka dhamma gain and loss good repute and ill repute praise and censure pain and happiness he never wavers he is firm as a solid rock of course this is the attitude of the arahan the perfect one of them it is said truly the good give up longing for everything the good prattle not with thoughts of craving touch by happiness or by pain the wise show neither elation nor depression refraining from intoxicant and becoming heedful establishing themselves in patience and purity the wise train their minds and it is through such training that a quiet mind is achieved can we also achieve it lord hoder answers the question thus yes but how well not by doing some great thing why was the saint saints someone asked and the answer came because they were cheerful when it was difficult to be cheerful patient when it was difficult to be patient they pushed on when they wanted to stand still and kept silent when they wanted to talk that was all so simple but so difficult a matter of mental hygiene the poet says it is easy enough to be pleasant 
when life flows along like a song but the man worthwhile is the man who can smile when everything goes dead wrong mention is made in our books the four wrong paths chattaru agati the path of greed chand of hate dosa of cowardice bhaya of delusion moha people commit evil being enticed along one or more of these wrong paths but the man who has reached perfect neutrality through the cultivation of equanimity always avoids such wrong paths his serene neutrality enables him to see all beings impartially a certain understanding of the working of karma actions and how karma comes into fruition karma vipaka is very necessary for one who is genuinely bent on cultivating equanimity in the light of karma one will be able to have a detached attitude towards all beings nay even inanimate things the proximate cause of equanimity is the understanding that all beings are the result of their actions karma shanti deva right in his bodhicharya avatar some there be that loath me then why shall i in being praise rejoice some there be that praise me then why shall i brood over blaming voice who master is of self will ever bear a smiling face he puts away all frowns is first to greet another and to share his all this friend of all the world truth crowns i have here made an attempt to give a glimpse of the seven enlightenment factors expounded over 2500 years ago by the supreme buddha for the attaining of full realization and perfect wisdom of nibbana the deathless the cultivation or the neglect of these factors of enlightenment is left to each one of us with the aid of the teaching of the buddha each one of us has the power to detect and destroy the cause of suffering each one individually can put forth the necessary effort to work out his deliverance the buddha has taught us the way to know life as it is and has furnished the directions for such a research by each of us individually therefore we owe it to ourselves to find out for ourselves the truth about life and to make the best of it we cannot say justifiably that we do not know how to proceed there is nothing vague in the teaching of the buddha all the necessary indications are clear as clear could be buddhism from beginning to end is open to all those who have eyes to see and minds to understand so clear is teaching that it can never be misunderstood the only thing necessary on our part for the full realization of the truth is firm determination endeavor and earnestness to study and apply the teaching each working it out for himself to the best of his ability the dhamma yet becomes the weary pilgrim to the happy heaven of nibbana's security and peace let us therefore cultivate the seven enlightenment factors with zest and unflagging devotion and advance remembering the saints of other days and recollecting how it was they lived even though today we put the after time 
yet one may win the abrosal path of peace may all living beings be well and happy